This is part one of radiographic assessment of bone lesions, the introduction. Before getting started, I want to acknowledge and recommend a couple of really good articles, one from radiology, bone tumors and tumor-like conditions, and the other from AJR, radiography and the initial diagnosis of primary bone tumors. So the most important factors in assessing a bone lesion on radiography are the age of the patient and the location of the lesion. Which bone? Where is it within the bone? Is it central, distal, etc.? So here's a list of lesions you'll have to memorize. No, you don't have to memorize these. Um, this is a large list. You can actually even expand this. So what I recommend is maybe learning a few of the more common ones, but instead of trying to memorize these lists, you have to put a lesion into one of three categories, and this is very useful. And that is either it's aggressive, it's non-aggressive, or it's in between. And the reason we want to do this is because not all aggressive processes are malignant. Here's an example of an infection that looks very aggressive and an example or also not all non-aggressive appearing lesions um, are benign. An example would be a well-defined lesion and this is multiple myeloma. Infection gets its own slide and that is because you want to always consider infection in any bone lesion, very important. So now we're going to move on to radiographic assessment, what we do when we see the radiograph. So we talked about age, location, and the assessment of the radiograph starts with the margin of a lesion, and that is the zone of transition, transition from the lesion to normal bone. The periosteal reaction, the matrix mineralization, you often can't see the matrix, it's what's inside of the lesion, unless it mineralizes. Size and number of the lesion, whether the cortex is involved, and whether there is soft tissue, a soft tissue component. So here is a nice diagram demonstrating from the left the more non-aggressive lesion to the right the most aggressive lesion. The one on the left has well-defined sclerotic margins, and the one on the right is uh, very ill-defined. These are known as geographic lesions, type 1A on the left, type 1B and 1C. Not important. More important is to recognize the patterns. The type 1A geographic lesion is well-defined with a sclerotic rim. An example. The 1B, geographic well-defined, but this time without the sclerotic rim. Here's an example. Type 1C is a, a geographic lesion that is not well-defined. Then we move on to type 2 lesions. Again, the classifications are not as important as the patterns. And this is ill-defined margins, broad zone of transition. It's not a geographic lesion and the type 2 is the moth-eaten. So here's an example of the moth-eaten type 2 lesion. There are several small lucencies. Likely some of these are um, ill-defined. And the final um, category is the permeative. That's the most aggressive. And here's an example. Uh, ill-defined lesions. Hard to see where the tumor begins and ends. So it has a very wide zone of transition. An example of the moth-eaten appearance in multiple myeloma, large lesion, hard to see where it starts and where it ends. Uh, permeative lesion, Ewing sarcoma, hard to see where it starts and very ill-defined. Very aggressive lesion. Another diagram showing the sclerotic well-defined lesion, upper left, lower right, most aggressive, permeative appearance. So after margin of zone and transition, you move on to periosteal reaction, how the bone is reacting, and again, from left to right, increasing aggressiveness. So the first lesion on the left is the unilamellated and well-defined periosteal reaction. And then you get the onion skin, um, multiple layers, more aggressive, perpendicular, spiculated, otherwise known as hair on end, more aggressive, uh, sunburst appearance. And then finally, the most is the elevated Codman triangle, where the lesion actually elevates the cortex. There's the lesion in red, advancing margin, causing the periosteal reaction to be elevated, and that is a Codman triangle in an aggressive lesion. Think of osteogenic sarcoma. Can you also see it in a benign lesion? That is correct. Infection uh, sometimes will have this. 
Uh, some examples on the left, well-defined periosteal reaction. This is hypertrophic osteoarthropathy. It can be seen in patients with lung cancer, etc. Perpendicular, spiculated, hair on end lesion, and even more aggressive is the osteosarcoma, and the most aggressive being the Codman triangle. Next is matrix mineralization, and this is helpful if you can tell whether the lesion appears chondroid or osseous, it helps narrow the differential. A couple of three examples of chondroid type matrix, the one on the left stipple, then you have flocculent and rings and arcs on the right. An example, you see this in enchondromas. Uh, then there's the other side, and that is the ma um, osseous matrix. You can see a solid osseous sclerotic region, cloud-like or ivory-like. Size and number can sometimes be helpful. For instance, an osteoid osteoma, when larger, becomes an osteoblastoma, or is termed an osteoblastoma, even though histologically they're the same. Same thing with fibrous cortical defect, non-ossifying fibroma, and enchondroma and chondrosarcoma. It's not size dependent. Instead, the size can sometimes help you be, uh, whether it could represent a chondrosarcoma if it's larger number of the lesions. So multiple sclerotic lesions can be seen in uh, dysplasia such as osteopoikleosis. Uh, multiple lucencies, you want to consider something like metastatic disease, multiple myeloma, brown tumors, and even if they're well defined, if there's many of them, you have to consider these uh, last few lesions. Cortical involvement and some examples are endosteal, endosteal scalloping, where the tumor or the lesion comes from the inside of the bone and scallops the cortex. It can actually expand the cortex, causing ballooning in this lesion, showing well-defined uh, margins but expanded cortex. A destroyed cortex here in a lesion that appears very aggressive, and this is a giant cell tumor, which is generally considered benign, so another example of an aggressive lesion. A soft tissue component can be very difficult to identify on a radiograph, but it does suggest a malignant process. The thing that will be helpful is to look for fat plane displacement. An example would be an osteogenic sarcoma, Ewing sarcoma, lymphoma can all do that. So this ends part one. Part two will be more about the actual tumor types.